Did we say? Look up. Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased to be spending some time for the next hour with David Rosenfeld, one of my favorite people and authors who has been here. Not every book, but pretty nearly every book. And tonight, we might get to see some of David Rosenfeld's dogs. So, David, you want to just give us a little glimpse of the dogs? Can you move your camera? Yes, they're all zonked because we had uh, two hours of thunderstorms that ended about an hour ago. So they were in a frenzy for two hours and so now they're sound asleep. So let me see what I can show you. Here's Aggie the new feet. Wow. There's Aggie. Okay. Right below me is a golden and a hound mix. Can you see them? Uh-huh. We can. And here is a huge mix of some kind, a bear, <laughs> sound asleep. And there on the floor is um, Lucy, who's <laughs> only a... She's, yeah, she, there she, she is. Her name. She, and over there is a lab mix named Sydney. She's blind. Um, Lucy's 180 pounds, if that gives your perspective on size. Wow. And the rest, of, the rest of them are in various areas of the house, sound asleep from their from the thunderstorm. They really are zonked out. So how many dogs do you currently have with you? Down to 13. We're heading towards normal. Aha. Uh -huh. So I thought it would be fun because Dog Tripping was such a wonderful book when you wrote it um, to see the actual dogs. Are any of these the dogs that you moved from California? No, sadly we lost the last one about two weeks ago. Oh. We actually had him longer than we had any other dog. We had him for 13 years. He's one of the few dogs we got as a young dog in California. Um, he was abandoned at our vet's office. And we took them as a favor to the vet. Took them as a favor. He was a fantastic dog. His name was Benji, and he just died a couple of weeks ago. He was the last one from California out of the 25. That's so hard. I know at least once when you were here doing an event, when you still lived in California, you would go home from our store with a dog. Two dogs. They yeah. were named Hunter and Tudor. They were identical golden retrievers. I know you know this. They were identical golden retrievers who were 12 years old who spent their entire life together and they had bandanas that they looked identical and they had bandanas that said hunter and tutor and we got them home to california and within 10 minutes our other dogs tore off their bandanas and for the next three years that we had them we had no idea which was which so we just called them hunter tutor <laughs> this is sort of identical twin story but dogs yeah weirdly they had nothing to do with each other in our house they sl they stayed in separate rooms and barely interacted. And then when they died, they died three days apart. Were they related? I mean, were they related by oh, they blood? Were, they were, yeah, they were uh, litter mates they oh. were together for 12 years. But it happens a lot here. We get two dogs that were together and are bonded, and then they make other relationships. And it's, I don't know how to explain it, but Hunter and Tudor had nothing to do with each other once they were in our house. So now that you're in Maine, is there a different process by which you acquire basically rescue dogs than when you lived in California? Oh, much different. In California, we would go to shelters and get 10 at a time, and we'd place them in homes, and we only brought homes to, home the dogs that were old or blind or epileptic, or for, for some reason, nobody else would want them, so we took them home. We're not gonna leave them in a cage. So um, here in New England, there's no rescue problem at all. They bring literally hundreds, if not thousands, of dogs up every month from the South to be placed, so there's no issues here. So the only dogs we take now are dogs that shelters call us and tell us they have a dog that they can't place for a health reason or age, so we take them. And in fact, we get dogs now from Memphis, Tennessee, and Houston, we got a couple in uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts. Uh, but no, we in New England, the problem is non-existent, or almost non-existent. I think I told you, we have a little rescue dog who's half Shiba Inu. Uh, Patrick is actually greyhounds, right? I had one, she passed Patrick, away. Patrick had a, a greyhound that he rescued. But anyway, we got our little dog from a rescue operation here. And when we asked about her history, they said that they didn't know it because she came from Los Angeles. And we were, were in Scottsdale, so I said, why did she come from Los Angeles, right? And they said, now, all the small size dogs in Arizona, purse dogs, are sent to Los Angeles. And the larger dogs in Los Angeles are sent to Phoenix. 
which I thought was yeah, a wonderful Sorry. statement. No, I was just going to say, I thought it was such an interesting statement. That's why we only took larger dogs, because they were so hard to place. But Los Angeles is horrible for all dogs. So maybe they're sending them from Phoenix as to, to a rescue group. That's a different situation. But if they wouldn't be sending them to the shelters in L.A. The shelters in L.A. are a, a, absolutely an abomination. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. No, they, she was definitely sent to a rescue group, but, you know, as a result, we don't really know how old she is or, you know, anything about her because she just arrived in Phoenix and we fell in love with her and I, I love her. In fact, uh, we have another dog that's a purebred that came from a kennel and when we lose him, we're going to get another rescue dog because there are so many dogs that really do need homes. Even when you know that when you're told the history, it's very often inaccurate. Because when if people turn their dog in, sometimes they make the dog sound worse than it is to justify giving them up, and sometimes they'll make it sound better in the hope that the shelter will be able to place them. So you just start at start at square one. Well, we just we just love her, but that that's our secret, you know. Love him and move on. And Patrick really loved his greyhound. I have a wonderful picture of is it Lucy. Was that her name? No, Penny. Penny. Penny curled up around um, a toy in her bed and you know dogs really tug at your hearts don't they yeah the greyhounds are spectacular they really have an amazing amount of dignity to them so you have been writing this wonderful series with new patterson new jersey lawyer andy carpenter um in which dogs always have a role but but they're not always the same role sometimes the dog's the client occasionally we're worried the dog is the victim you know how do you decide what role a dog will play when you start a book? Do you start with a dog or do you start with a, a story and then you fit in the dog? Actually, I only start with the dog. All, all I know about him, the, the dog leads Andy into the case. Okay, and so that's all I think about. I, I think about how, the, how a dog will lead Andy into the case. I don't even know what the case is at that point and very often don't for the first hundred pages. But the only thing I start with is how the dog leads him in. Do you, do you um, fix on a particular kind of dog? I mean, I know that Andy's own personal dog is, is a golden, but there are other breeds that come into the stories. No, I sort of let the publisher decide. <laughs> they do a book jacket with a great looking cute dog, and that often becomes the dog that's in the Aha. Uh -huh. So if I were looking at Muzzled, we have autographed copies here, which David was kind enough to send us. Tell us what dog this is holding his Pat, blue leash. Enough. He's what? It, believe it or not, if I, I hope I got to remember the name. Is a Nova Scotia Duck Troller. Nova Scotia Duck Troller. I think that's their name, actual name. Wow. Which was a little unusual to have in Patterson, New Jersey. Looks like Paul, looks like so, Paul doesn't it? Right, so I had, I had to work that in. But that's um, that's what it is. They, they took the picture in New York, and they, they told me that's what it is. I love it. We have a, a dog in the store that belongs to one of our staff and he comes to work, he's a rescue dog, and <laughs> the dog on the cover of your book looks exactly like Paul. <laughs> Patrick was just telling us that he really does. You know, he's got that, that nose, that longer face and the brown nose, and he's the same color, and you know, so when we looked at the book, we all went, Paul. <laughs> Larger well, I could do a DNA test now. <laughs> we, we've, got, we've got a DNA test on three dogs and you never know what they are. It, you you could guess and never know. Really? Uh, we, we once rescued a purebred golden retriever that was pregnant, and she had six puppies, and all six were black, right? And so if we had not known who the mother was, we never would have guessed that it was a, at least 50% golden. Wow. So over the course of time, Andy still has Tara, who's apparently going to be a dog that lives to 30 or something. Um, but they've also acquired another dog called Sebastian. So Tara's the golden, what's Sebastian? The Basset Hound, a lazy Basset Hound. Basset. Who moves with the speed of a filing cabinet. Tara was, um, when I first wrote the first book, Open and Shut, it was 2002. And she was seven, uh, she was nine. And now she's seven. <laughs> so, so she's doing really well. She is doing well. It's going to be like Spencer, who migrated from a Korean War veteran to Vietnam to like the Gulf War in the Parker books, right? He just right. Kept... But he he actually had his dog die, which yeah. was shocking to me. He had Pearl die, which I was amazed that he did that. 
If I had a dog die, I would lose 99% of my readers. Yes, you would. I absolutely, I agree. But it's nice People that- it, I mean, go into stores and pick up the book and skim through it to see if Tara's name is mentioned near the end. So they'll feel okay buying the book. It says on, oh, because they don't have this copy that I have on my advanced reading copy when it specifically mentions Tara in the first paragraph. <laughs> In the first paragraph, right, but they're concerned at the end that she'll die sometime during the book. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, I'll, that's the old rule, you know, don't kill a dog or a cat. You can knock off okay. all the people you want. <laughs> yeah. So, that's right. in this case, one of the things I did, um, and I will send you the link if I didn't, I did a little conversation about your book, a little book pitch on Instagram because you can do a little televised thing earlier today. And, um, and I really enjoyed it. But one of the things that I read was that wonderful section um, when you talk about retirement or semi-retirement. I think it's one of the best things you've read when Andy doesn't want to take a case because he's retired. And if he takes the case, it will blow him out of retirement. And Lori argues that in fact, if he takes the case, it will say oh. that he is successful at semi-retirement. And they thought, you're the only person I know who could actually write that. It's just so funny. I had to come up with a fresh way to keep Andy, in every book now, Andy doesn't want to take the case. So I had to come up with a fresh way for him to do it. So now from, from that point on, from what you just read, that point on, he's a semi-retired lawyer. I love it. Our differences are semantic, Lori says. You consider yourself retired. I see it as semi-retired. I think you should come around to my point of view. That way you'd avoid disappointment. How is that? Well, if you're retired, then taking a case blows the whole thing out of the water. But if you're semi-retired, then it fits right in. You won't feel like you failed at retirement. You'll be a success at semi-retirement. Oh. That's brilliant. I'm I, no there's not a tough in the room here. The dogs are <laughs> choking up like that. Well, you know, I, I do love the way that Lori and Andy, you know, have developed a relationship that at one point went really on the rocks because Lori was a, a cop there in Patterson and then suddenly went off to become chief of police in a small town in Wisconsin. And I thought, you've broken them up because you don't want to deal with a married Andy Carpenter. But then that didn't work out. And Lori I, came at back. At the time they broke up, that's what I thought. I thought she was gone for good. And what happened? I don't know. I changed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get to do that. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's incredibly useful because now that she's not a, a cop and forced to pay attention to cop rules, now she's the private investigator for Andy. And so she's part of the team with, um, with, with the lawyer who is the, the other lawyer who's always grumpy and the non-working secretary. So, you know, you've got a little team there, a carpenter team. Right, Lori is slowly evolving to not be so um, on the side of law enforcement and willing to cut corners like Andy, which Andy does uh, to a much greater degree. But Lori is starting to come around a little bit. I noticed that. I think that's good. And between them, they can cope with having an adopted child because the problem, you know, with, with sleuths that have children um, is who's minding the kid while, you know, they're all sleuthing. But they manage to either trade that off or who else do they depend on for child care? Uh, well, they, have, they get sitters, but he has a friend, a close friend that they drop him off at his house. And one book, he was away at camp. It is a problem. It's a problem both for to handle the child and a dog. Because you can't go running off. And, you know, people are thinking, where's the dog? I know that's what I'm thinking when I'm reading a book. So, you know, you have to be care I have to juggle that. So one of the things you've always been great at is financial fraud. I often think that if you weren't a writer, you could just be a career criminal. Although um, I'm not sure how your nerve would hold up, but you do, you do come up with these elaborate plots. Many of them are financial. I mean, you're not, you're not you know, going the terrorist route or the whatever, but you're coming up with, I think, fascinating stuff. We can't say a whole lot about this, but give us a little bit of a setup for Muzzle. Um, if you remember. Well, yeah, I think I did. I just finished another Andy, so I hope I don't get him confused. Stop me if I did, if All I right. do, okay. But um, the Andy gets a phone call early on from 
a woman whose job, whose hobby it is, Andy rescues dogs, and this woman's hobby it is to find owners, the owners of her lost dogs, to reunite dogs with their owners. And she calls, and a guy had called, she, so she's tracked down this dog through a chip, and she knows who owned him. And the owner was a guy who was killed on a boat a few weeks earlier in an explosion with two of his co work colleagues. And the reason the woman's calling Andy is because the owner of the dog just called her. And he's obviously supposed to be dead. So they can't be sure that it's this guy, but they, they, they arrange a setup to see if it's him, and sure enough, it's him. So a guy who was supposed to have been killed three weeks earlier shows up as the owner of the dog. So that sets it off. And then ultimately, I don't want to say too much about it, partially because I don't remember too much about it, but partially I don't want to give anything away, but it involves a, um, a drug company this time with a drug that's designed to uh, uh, prevent, uh, to, to stop super, cure super illnesses of superbugs. So how does and Andy get drawn into this? Because somebody is obviously arrested and is going to go on trial. Andy gets into it, drawn into it because when they're there, when the guy gets arrested, they've arranged for the police to be there in case it was him. And this guy, in the moment, is more worried about what's going to happen to his dog than what's going to happen to himself. And that, for Andy, is like a, a trigger. Like, you bet. It, yeah, so that's, what's, that's what gets him into it. I like that. I mean, I think, you know, that's as good a character read as one might come up with. You know, he can't really be this heartless bastard if what he is most worried about is who's going to care for his dog. Right, and Andy also feels guilty because it was Andy that got him arrested in the first place. Had the guy just shown up and they gave him his dog and not brought the police in, then it, the guy wouldn't have been arrested, at least at that point. So Andy has some measure of guilt about that, which is dramatically compounded by the guy's obvious love for his dog. So Andy is a lawyer, but uh, lawyers don't have power of arrest and so forth. So you have another two useful characters in this series. Mostly, they sit around and drink beer and watch sports with Andy, but occasionally, like Pete, he actually does some work, right? Yeah, he's a homicide captain. The other one is a, a, a newspaper editor. And all they do is sit around and drink beer and watch sports and insult each other. It mirrors my life pretty closely. <laughs> So, no, but, but Pete is a really useful... I'm not stretching to do it. Okay. But Pete is a useful character because at some point you do need a real cop. Although in one of the books, Pete himself was arrested and in jeopardy. And that was a, another case that Andy was drawn into. You never seem to run out of plot ideas. I'm always so impressed with how fertile your imagination is. getting close, is. Barbara. I'm getting close. If you have any, send them on because I'm getting close. So, this is now... This is like the 30th book, 31st book. Seems amazing. Well, you've written two books a year in many years, and some of them three, are not three Andy. For last, Sorry? Three for the last few years, including this oh, year. Oh, that's right, because you've done the, the Christmas book in addition to the July book, and then the, the thriller in the spring. Um, so mm -hmm. clearly you, you do have lots of great plot ideas. Do, do you approach the thrillers differently than the Andy Carpenters? You must. I used to approach it much differently because the thriller, the Andy Carpenter books are, you know, it's Andy's voice talking in mostly first person present tense. Um, so it's Andy's voice. The, the, the earlier through the other thrillers were more like real writing in my view, like they were third person past tense. So, you know, I, I couldn't rely on the weirdness of Andy's head to carry the day. I had to actually write serious stuff. So um, those were very different. Now, the new series, is, the first book is called The K-Team, and it's sort of a spin-off on the Andy series. So Andy's in it, um, and Willie Miller and Sam, and or they're all in it, but it's focused on this team of investigators, which is Laurie is one of them, and Marcus is another who's in the Andy books, and then the third one is a new guy named Corey, um, and it's, it's spoken in Corey's voice. So it's, it's easier for me because it's, again, it's a person talking, but it's, um, but it's different than the Andes. Hopefully the, he's a different character. Well, yeah, they, I think it is different. Marcus is somebody that I've always enjoyed. Marcus hardly ever speaks, right? He's mostly there right. as a gigantic and lethal presence. 
Right. He speaks, but it's incomprehensible to anybody other than Lori. Right. She's the only one to understand what he's saying. But he's, he's in that wonderful mold then. You know, we had way back when Robert Kreis first wrote Elvis Cole, he always had Joe Pike, you know, as kind of the muscle backup. Dennis Lehane wrote, I think, five books, and Bubba, if I recall, was, is that right, Patrick, do you remember? For Lehane, yeah, Bubba. Yeah, it was Bubba, who was that kind of muscle backup, and then, of course, Spencer had Hawk, you know, um, and, and I've always enjoyed that, that sort of partnership where you had one, basically, unstoppable, you know, backup guy, while the less physical guy was out there taking chances and sleuthing. I think I may have inadvertently ripped off uh, Marcus from Hawk. I think, because I was a huge Spencer fan. And um, so I, so he's very different, but I sort of like have a feeling like that's where he, that was the, the origin of him. But I love those superhero kind of right. characters. You know, like, I, I mean, my favorite character ever is Jack Reacher, <laughs> you know? And I mean, he's not a backup, he's not a sidekick, but he's, you know, he's like, nothing bad's gonna happen to this guy. This guy's gonna try him. And I, I like that. And which is why, why I always like the Spencer books, because they were both superheroes. Yes. And he and Hulk. Very true, in different ways. Although Marcus is not like Hawk, because Hawk has some mouth on him, and Marcus, Marcus has only stood by Laurie. So I don't, you know, in that respect, they're quite different. I often, I often think that the dialogue between Hawk and Spencer was some of the best ever. Terrific, absolutely. This Parker was a genius. I just love Parker so. Very spare. He did a, you know, he and Elmer Leonard, I think, in many ways, wrote the sparest prose. They could do more just with dialogue, and and yet it just completely gripped you. Patrick, can you think of anybody else who writes like that? Um, boy, uh, maybe George V. Higgins, the friends of Eddie Coyle, um, but not really. Yeah, and, you know, people sort of made fun of the Parkers towards the end because the margins kept getting wider, you know, because, but <laughs> in, but in a way, he was just getting better in the sense that he could pare down the story to as few words as possible. And so to make it look like a real book, they inflated all the space around him. But I didn't think that they really lost anything. The only stuff I got tired of in the Parker books was the conversations between he and Susan. Of course you did. And after a while, <laughs> enough for her. <laughs> right. Very true. I think, I think Ace Atkins has done a very good job with the Spencers and with evolving um, Susan's relationship, but I, Mike Lupica has taken up the Sonny Randall series, which I really enjoy. And um, in the most recent one, we just talked to him about it, he has uh, Sonny going to Susan as a therapist and Sonny sitting around speculating about what kind of man, you know, Susan would be attracted to, and it's really fun. It's a different way of coming at Parker. She she over her ex husband. Yeah, she the mom, the yeah. son of the mom. Oh, Sonny. Uh, no, no, it's that whole Parker dynamic of you know the the relationship where they can't live together, can't separate. Um, I think she's gravitating a little bit away towards Jesse Stone, who has the same problem. Right. Um, so they've introduced. We touched on this just a moment ago. Her ex-husband, Sonny's ex-husband, has a child that he had in a brief marriage while they were, and now the child has come back to Boston to live, and so um, the child is going to kind of split them up because he needs to, she doesn't want to be a mom, and he needs to take care of his child. So we'll see. Lupica's writing Jesse Stone and Sonny Randall, oh. so it wouldn't be that, that odd that Sonny might move towards Jesse um, in Paradise a little bit more. We'll see. You know, I don't think any Parker character except Spencer is ever going to get really anchored to another person. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Lubica fan from sports. He's a so, wonderful um, writer. They're very funny. Um, I, I truly have enjoyed the, the two that he's done. And he'll be doing a Jesse Stone in September. So I'll send you a, a note when, when I'm going to do a program with him because you'll probably enjoy talking yeah, he's to him. He's terrific. Yeah, I think so too. So what is your Christmas book going to be this year? It's called, it's an Andy, it's called Silent Bite. <laughs> okay. 
And get it? I get did. it or I did. Tunnel. Silent Fight. And what, what dog do we have featured on the cover of that one? We have a lab, I think. I think it's a lab. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, I think I'm getting I'm getting it confused with the one with the next one for March. Which I think is a shepherd. I, I'm, I'm losing track, but That's I think something. it's a lab. So you think the K team book in March will be a shepherd, and the Christmas Andy will be a lab? And here we have, you know, our usual mix. What is the dog in this one? What kind of a dog is he? He's the dog and muzzled. Yeah. Well, you the just Nova said. Scotia. Yeah, you just said he's that complicated. <laughs> the Nova Scotia or whatever. Do you think there's somebody at St. Martin's who's just leafing through like, you know, breeds or kennel papers or something to find all these dogs? I have no idea, but they really do good covers. So whatever they do is fine with me. True. No, I like the muzzle cover. The muzzle cover I really like. I like the blue leash. Um, I think the way he's carrying that in his mouth is just a lot of fun. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't have a dog that carries a leash. I have dogs that run from leashes, so it's a different dynamic. Um, right. Um, Patrick, do we have any questions? Or yeah. Any? Patrick yeah. is over here taking Facebook questions, so he's going to step up and ask you some. All right. Well, for one thing, David, you have a, a really great group of people that are, that are watching along. Quite a large crowd of fans uh, from all over the place. And uh, I guess the first question is from Colette, who asks, do all of your dogs get along? Yes, they all do. Um, it, we'll take any dog. We'll never have a reason not to take a dog other than they're not dog friendly. So we make sure of that going in. And yes, they get along. I mean, there's an occasional spat. It, it does usually break into a fight. Sometimes they'll like bark angrily at each other. Um, but they always get along. We've only had to return one dog to a rescue group, uh, a golden retriever who came into the house. This was in California, so it was 10 years ago. Came into the house, got into a fight. I reached in stupidly and got 21 stitches. The dog bit me. Um, so we had to return it because we, we just can't have that. You know, and it's such a, we always have such a great group and they get along so well. I think rescue dogs are somehow grateful. Um, but they all get along, yes. So we've never had a problem of any serious consequence. Even when you had 26 or 27 dogs? Even when we had 42. 42, wow. Yeah. Well, was that your high yeah. count in California? 42 was. But you were yeah. in California for that? Yes, and I've beaten this joke to death, but we, we never now have over 40 because we think that's over 40 is slightly eccentric. <laughs> How many dogs but, um, did you move in? We never had under 30 in California, I don't think, really? until the end. How many dogs did you move in dog tripping? I've forgotten. 25. Okay, so it really was a caravan. Yes, nine on each of two RVs and seven on the third. That's an amazing. I hated, I hated every second of it. <laughs> every second of it. Yeah, but you got a wonderful book out of it. Yeah, and every, all the other adults, all the other humans loved it. They, they still, to this day, email each other at the anniversaries, remembering how great it was when we stopped in Iowa, right? It was like 20 degrees in Iowa. It was freezing there. But they all had a great time. Why didn't you? Well, first of all, I'm just like a miserable character in life, right? But um, I don't know. Maybe I thought I was sort of in charge or something, and I was afraid something was going to go wrong. And, you know, I felt like I was on bivouac. I mean, it was just miserable. We pulled into, you know, we stopped at a hotel each night and everybody else went in, except three of us stayed on the three RVs. Debbie stayed on one, I stayed on another, and a, and a friend named Emmett stayed on the third. So we, I was out in the cold every night, not getting any sleep. It was extraordinarily Okay, all right, another question? You got a good book out of it though. I knew I actually that I was gonna write that book while I was on the trip. I didn't decide until like a couple of months later that it might make a good book. So I would have had, I would have had more to say if I was taking notes as we went along, but I wasn't. Well, there are a couple of people who have questions that all kind of combine that are sort of, um, you know, practical questions that, you know, we all have for people that have a, a crazy number of animals, which is, 
does the truck of dog food kind of back up to your house? Uh, how does that work? How do you deal with different diets, different kinds of food, some of those mechanical details? And then finally, yeah, no, we, go ahead. Sorry, ben. No, it's okay. No, we're good, sir. I was just going to say, and as sort of a corollary to that, um, can you ever take a vacation? Uh, how in the world do you find a pet sitter for all of your dogs? Okay, in terms of the dog food, no, they don't come up to our house. They would, but you don't want it. It's life's too short to have people deliver to our house. I mean, when FedEx shows up, it sounds like a fox hunting here. <laughs> so I'd, I'd much rather go to the store and get it, which I do. Um, in terms of special diets, yes, when, when a dog has to be on a special diet, we do that. And they go in, and we feed them all out in the open. Um, but if a dog's on a special diet, then they go into a room and with the door closed so that the other dogs can't graze and, you know, have some of their food. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the last, last part of it? The, the last bit was about um, taking a vacation. Are you able to do that? Do you oh, have yes. We sitters? have a fantastic setup. We have two, two friends who are also our dog sitters who... Um, they come when you know when we leave, and there's there's somebody here 24/7. One of them is here all day, and the other's here at night. And the dogs get taken care of better than when we're home. I mean, they're they're remarkable, and they like notice things. Like we had a, a Great Pyrenees, uh, nine years old, and our friend Jenny noticed that she sort of wasn't feeling well, like didn't look right. And I never would have noticed that. And Jenny took her to the vet. And it turned out she wound up. Um, she what, I'm sorry, we we lost you there. What it turned out she what? Kidney removed. Oh. And there's no and she lived another almost two years, and there's no chance that I would have noticed it. Why not? Uh, because I'm not as careful about it. I mean, we have so many dogs here, and and they just pay better attention than I do. I mean, not, not than Debbie does, but than I do. Um, so, but they're, so yes, we can go away, you know, whenever they're available and, and it's, it's no worries at all. We never even have to call home. So when you go away, where do you go? A variety of places? Mostly New York. Huh. We're, we're theater junkies and we go to New York. Debbie's in New York now, actually. Um, so, you know, and we have family there. So that's, that's our vacation of choice now. Nice. Okay, uh, Susan asks, are, are there any more uh, non-fiction books coming up along? No, I don't think so. Um, I wrote two. I wrote Dog Tripping and Lessons from Tara, which was sort of a sequel to Dog Tripping Without the Trip. Mm -hmm. It's actually my favorite book that I ever wrote. Um, but by the time I got near the end of Lessons from Tara, I was running dry. Like I had, <laughs> I had done all the dog stuff I had to do. And so I, I took to um, puffing it up. So in, if, I, if I would say, uh, I put the leash on Cheyenne, and I, I would say, instead of saying I, I took Cheyenne to the vet, I would say, I, put, I got the leash, I put it on Cheyenne, I walked her to the car, and I took her to the vet, right, to stretch it out. So no, I have nothing left to me of that. And I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to write nonfiction of any other subject. So. I definitely am not planning to do that again. Okay, I have a, a lady named Pat who asks, uh, does your publisher believe that, dog, uh, that books with dogs on the cover sell better? Um, and I guess you can maybe tell us the story uh, about you know, the first handful of books that did not feature the dog on the cover. And okay, I've written with five Andy Carpenters and they were all pretty well received, some award nominations and, and they were doing okay, but nothing special. And, and I, um, I wrote a sixth one, which was going to be the last one. And it was called Play Dead. And it was the first book in which a dog was actually, actually integral to the plot. Um, more like the recent ones have been. So the publisher put a golden retriever on a cover. And it sold twice as many copies as previous ones. So <laughs> then because of that, they asked me to write another one and in fact, they said, um, they asked me if I read another one, I said yes. A week later, before I had the germ of an idea of what the story would be, they sent me the book jacket. 
and it had two dogs on the cover. It had a golden and a Bernese. So I actually wrote the book to the jacket, which, which is I'm not sure how Hemingway used to do it, but I, so I wrote it with two dogs. So ever since then, yes, there's no, no, if I rewrote the judgment in Nuremberg, it would have a dog on the cover, right? It's, it, it definitely, you know, people would write to me in the early ones when, when dogs were on the cover and they'd say, you know, I'm embarrassed. I only bought the book because of the dog on the cover. Like I could care less why I bought the book. But um, yes, there will always be a dog on the cover. The two, the two definites are there'll be a dog on the cover and no dog will ever get hurt or killed. Well, see, that's the mark of a true professional, writing to the cover. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I have a couple of people that are, are fans of particular breeds of dogs, of course. Um, pugs and uh, Boston Terriers. Are there any uh, dogs that you haven't written about that you would like to write about? Good question. Um, greyhounds, for instance. <laughs> yeah, I would actually would love to write about greyhounds. I love greyhounds. Oh, greyhounds and Great Danes are two dogs we've never had that I would like to write about. Um, problem with great, uh, greyhounds is if you think a Nova Scotia duck trawler receiver, a retriever is unusual in Patterson, so is a greyhound, right? They only, they, uh, and then even in LA, we never once saw a greyhound in a shelter. And I think they're only really in areas where there were dog tracks or are dog tracks. Yeah. Um, so I love greyhounds. I would like to write greyhounds and great things. What is <coughs> What if Andy took a trip somewhere to a place that had a racetrack, or the dog racetrack, and strangely enough, there he could acquire a greyhound and bring him back? That will, and then become Andy's dog, you mean? Well, yeah, why not? He can, can certainly do that. I'm you just know, giving I, you I, an idea. No, I can certainly do that. I, I've often thought about having Andy take a trip and, and move the story out of Patterson, New Jersey, to wherever Andy's going. But it's, you know, then I have to move the whole ensemble, you know, and it's not so easy. No, but he could easily be traveling and come across a dog for one reason or another he elects to bring back to Patterson, and then you don't have yeah, that problem. Absolutely. absolutely. A, Greyhound would, a Great Dane would be perfect for that. Either we one. Had a friend, we had a friend in California, the, if you remember the old Batman series? Yep. I, the guy who played Robin, his name Burt Ward, he and his wife had ran a Great Dane rescue out of their house in California. Wow. And they they would have a hundred Great Danes or more in their house. How? At any, at any one time. They had like this estate in a place called Norco and they ran it out of their house. It was remarkable. I can't Made imagine. I mean, they're so big. How in the world yeah. could you get that many animals in one house unless it were enormous? They just roamed the place. It was amazing. Um, Great Danes are like you know, big dogs are, are very often less of a problem to have in a house than little dogs because they're much less active. Really? Like we have three Mastiffs that are 180 pounds each, and they are the three, three the easiest dogs we ever, we ever had. Wow. When we were at Ashford Castle a year ago, May, back when you could still travel, um, one of the features of the castle was every day uh, the official keeper would arrive at 10 o'clock for coffee and bring an Irish wolfhound with him. Wow, oh, wow. beautiful dog, enormous dog, you know, and people were just glued to this, you know, you did, they, they didn't encourage you to touch him, but people, especially children, you know, because he looked like a pony, right, to, to children, people Those would all, are yeah. just, just gorgeous. And at the outside of the castle, they have a, a statue of a wolfhound on either side the front door, sort of like the lion's patience and fortitude outside the New York Public Library. So they had these two wolfhounds, but this live one was just, I mean, it was the highlight of the day. Oh, they're amazing. Also. No kidding. Right. Any more? Yeah. Um, let's see here. Is there another uh, Doug Brock book in the works? Good question. I don't, think so. I don't think so. There's sort of like no room for it. I like writing the K team books, which is which will be in March, and um, I'm writing Andy's at least last year, this year, and next year in July, and you know, and then for Christmas. So I'm I'm not sure there's a groundswell of, of need out there for for a fourth Roosevelt book every year. So probably not. 
I really like Doug. How many did you write? He was your series character in your in your thrillers. Right. I wrote three of them. Okay. Which is always sort of a good number. People, I don't, why is it that trios always seem to be the number? How many, how, I mean, how many people do you ever know that said, I wrote a set pet about, you know, Doug Brown? Yeah. Is okay. that the black and blue? Huh? Is that the black and blue? Uh, black and blue, fade to black, and the first one was called Blackout. Yeah. And they were really good. I thought the stories were terrific. And the second one, you basically propelled us into a third one, the way the second one ended, if I remember right. I guess. I don't know. You, you don't remember. Either. I probably remember it better than you do, right? <laughs> I'm pretty yes. sure that the way the second one ended really demanded, there was still story left. It really demanded that you write one more book. I like them a lot. I also absolutely love the one where it started out with a guy who was a reverse commuter. Um, it was a it was a standalone, and he lived in New York, and he commuted to New Jersey oh, right, instead of right. the other way around. I thought that, and it, there was a law thing involved in that. I thought that was a terrific book. I liked writing those. It, it made me feel more like a real writer because it was, <laughs> you know, third person. It was, you yeah. know, it was much harder to do. Well, you you are know, a real writer. Like a, if I'm stuck in an Andy book, I can muse for a couple of pages inside my Andy's head. I can't, you couldn't do that in those books, so it was more challenging. I, I actually enjoyed writing those books a lot. And was, some of them I really liked. Was that book Heart of a Killer? It was, wasn't it? Wasn't there a heart involved? Yeah, he was the lawyer, yes. Heart of a Killer, I loved, but I mean, I, but I made a really dumb mistake in Heart of a Killer. Um, but. Uh, which I don't even need to say now, but but I I love that book. That that was I really liked that a lot, and I liked um, Airtight a lot, and I liked On Borrowed Time a lot. Mm -hmm. Those were my favorites of those books, and then the Doug Brock books. I thought they were excellent, but I can see how at this point maybe with all that's going on, the K team would be slightly easier. I'm just I'm really comfortable with those characters. Yeah. Like when I started Andy. It's like meeting up with old friends, you know, and, and by the time I'm finished with it, I'm sick of those old friends. <laughs> but but it's um, it's very comfortable, it's very easy for me. That's nice. Anything else? Yeah, um, let's see. H have you had any Hollywood uh, interest in the books uh, for movies and TV? And uh, who would play Andy Carpenter? I'll take the last part first. I, I, I was a movie executive my whole life, or my whole, most of my adult life. So it was my job to, to know all these actors and actresses and, and so on. I have no idea now. I don't know any, anybody anymore. Um, so when Peter, people ask me, like, who would you like to play Andy? I'm a dinosaur. I'm thinking Peter Falk would be good. You know, I, mean, I just, I don't have a clue. Um, there was, uh, Andy was, uh, Andy almost got sold as a, as a, I wrote a pilot and almost got sold as a series and it didn't. Um, they talked about Noah Wiley possibly being Andy. Uh, On Borrowed Time was optioned as a movie. It wasn't made, and now it's optioned as a dramatic podcast. Um, the, the closest I had, in, I guess, to the most aggravating of all was um, Steve Carell signed on to, to produce and star in a film version of Dog Tripping, and that didn't get made, which was really aggravating. I was buying suitcases carried a cash home and it never got made. But Steve Carell would have been perfect. He would have been, he'd be a good Andy too, although he's probably older than Andy is. He would have been, you know, Doc Trippy would have been interesting for you to watch somebody else be you uh, in a role that made you uncomfortable. That would be fascinating. I would have been, Steve Carell would have been just fine with me. Just fine. Um, there was no, there's, there was sort of no dramatic thrust to dog tripping. Like they leave California, they and they get to Maine, right? So it needed something else, you know, some danger or something, which could have been put in, but the studios I, just weren't. I don't know. I think road trips are, you know, good enough on their own. But yeah, I suppose you could have one, you know, a, a kidnapping or one RV somehow get sidelined or various things. Yeah, that or it could have been offbeat, like a Little Miss Sunshine. You right. know that movie? Yes, I do. Like, or, or National Lampoon's Vacation meets uh, dog tripping. <laughs> well, maybe we'll okay. inspire somebody with this conversation to think about making a movie out of dog tripping. I love it. Barbara, else? Well, Barbara, you mentioned that you'd seen White Fang. 
not too long ago. Yeah. About the White Fang movie. What's your what do you, what's your feeling on dog CGI dogs versus real dogs? Do you know what we're talking about? I couldn't hear what you said. Um, White Fang is a movie. They used um, CGI as the dog okay. rather than a real dog, and you could tell for sure that it was not a real dog. Do you think that people will embrace that? Not if it doesn't look. No, I think not. I think not. But I, I have no idea. But and I didn't see that movie. But dog lovers are pretty specific. Um, and pretty loyal to, to dogs so I, I think probably not but who knows and if it's realistic enough i mean if you see some things online now where they look like real people talking and they're not so who knows i think it would, it would have been really difficult to have trained a dog to do the things that happened in this movie um, I liked it for the scenery and other things. My husband really didn't like it because he didn't think that the dog was realistic enough. But I don't think they could really have made the movie with a, a real dog. And it, what was the original? Was it Call of the Wild? Wasn't that the basic story? Oh, White Fang. Yeah. But it was did, White Fang. Wasn't, wasn't that another movie with a real dog a while back? Oh, you may be right about that. Yes, I think so. Yes. So you know, I didn't. I don't remember seeing the original movie, Call of the Wild, but I'm pretty sure there was one. I'd have to look it up. So you know, part of it too, you know, David, is people just like trying out new technology, see how it goes. I'm sure that technology will advance to the point where you won't be able to tell the difference. Well, not only that, since you can't really get a company of actors together, they finished uh, the blacklist with. Um, a cartoonist because the the series was you know the, the last episode had to shut down because of the pandemic and so their solution to it was to bring in a cartoonist to draw the the final action scenes and some people like it and some people hated it i haven't seen it but um it's a, it's a totally new world and as a former movie marketing guy i think um as an example the hamilton on, on disney plus is is going to be so successful getting subscriptions that it's going to change distribution movie distribution forever i'm not uh, sure that movie theaters are going to survive this anyway or at least a lot of them won't just because it's i think now uncomfortable to people to think about crowding in together um right. and as tvs get bigger and screening and sound systems get better exactly. and so forth you know then you're almost better off to watch it at home where you can take a bathroom break if you want or go get a beer or, you know, whatever without disturbing people. It used to be for many years, first it was radio, then television, then cable television. All these things were going to kill movie theaters and never did, but this really has a chance between the new technology, the streaming stuff, and the things like the pandemic. I, theaters could be in big trouble. Big well, I hope not. You know, it was, we're both old enough to have had them be a major part of our childhood. I remember when I was a kid and I got a 25 cent allowance. This is a long time ago. Our big deal was to walk up, you know, the streets of Winneka to the community house and we would spend our quarter to, we could see a movie and have a box of popcorn. And that was like the highlight of the week, you know, on Saturday afternoon. And that's when the news, do you remember when they had the pate, you know, the black and white summaries of the news would show the newsreel before the feature film? When I was at a place where my client was 20th Century Fox at a time when they discovered a vault of old movie tone newsreels. That's it was fantastic. I loved watching that stuff. It was great. Well, maybe it'll come back on streaming services, but I remember, I mean, it was a real part of my childhood. You know, this is what we did on Friday nights in high school. We would all get together and go to the Teatro del Lago, you know, and if you were lucky, you got to hang out with the cool kids and sit with them. And, you know, high school, there's just like ghettos, you know, everywhere. So, uh, but movie theaters were, were like the gathering place. There weren't big malls in those days. This is back in the 50s. So the movie were you one of the cool kids? Were you one of the cool kids? Because if so, we would not have seen each other much. Uh, no, actually, I was kind of a nerdy, studenty kid. Uh, maybe so, we could hung out. Yeah, we maybe could have done that. Anyway, I'd be sad to see them go, but so much is changing so fast. I think that um, you know, we just be glad that we had that experience and um, maybe drive-ins will come back. Well, drive-ins are coming back. No, drive-ins really are, but in Phoenix, that's 
that it's 112 today or something, you, you know, sitting in your car at a drive-in is not feasible and running the air conditioning sitting in the drive-in could actually be a bad idea all the way around. So, but in other places, I understand that drive-in theaters really are making a comeback. Right, but it, you know, it won't be in winter, you know, it's, it's limited, it's really I agree. limited. Well, we'll see. And, and movie companies need to have a lot of theaters to release these movies. And if they don't have them, then they're going to go right to streaming and get, and, you know, work subscriptions. So I, I think, think that's so too. Well, I'm going to hope that some over written by David Rosen will eventually make it onto the screen because it would be really fun to see one. Yes, it would. Well, we'll root for <laughs> I, that. I would enjoy it more than you, probably. <laughs> Well, I guess maybe we'll do this again in the fall, since the chances are that you won't make it out here with your Christmas book, but we can have a good time again. Maybe we can have some wassail, you know, or beer. Anytime. Anytime. I love coming there, and I actually made myself feel better today for not being there. I checked weather.com for Scottsdale. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you were happy that you're not here. (laughs) But we'll try for October, and maybe in the spring you can actually come and see us, which would be nice, and also the weather will be more in your favor. If I can, I'll be there. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for signing the books. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, we do have autographed copies here of Muscle for you, so we hope that you will pick one up as a thank you to David. Um, Bye. Thanks, Barbara. You're welcome. And bye to everybody there, too.